All right, everybody take your seats, please. We're getting ready for the Seafood for the Future Wild Ride. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I'm very excited about this. Uh, so you are all here for our uh, debut preview event of a very special series that we recently put together. For, so for those of you who have just joined us, we've actually been in this room all day today talking about aquaculture communications and the importance of marine aquaculture for a sustainable food system um, and how we can support um, addressing public misperceptions about um, U.S. marine aquaculture and how we can support and facilitate the growth, the responsible growth of the industry here in the U.S. So one of the projects that we've been working on here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, um, along with USC Sea Grant, I don't know where Linda is, there she is, um, and NOAA is this video series. And the idea behind this video series was three parts. The first idea was in one of our aquatic academies, actually, we got to use some of the guests as guinea pigs. Aquatic Academy is an adult lecture series we hold here at the aquarium. And we had asked them what it was that they wanted to know about marine aquaculture. And they said, well, you know, we know what dairy farms look like. We know what chicken farms look like, but we can't relate to marine aquaculture. You throw out that term, we don't know what it looks like. So one of the ideas behind this video series was to get people familiar with what the different types of marine aquaculture are here in the U.S. and what they look like. And it was also to show and humanize the farmers and the scientists. So, you know, A, to humanize those two entities, but also to show that there is a connection. The farmer is not just throwing a rock out in the water saying, I'm going to farm here because I feel like it and it sounds like a good idea, right? There's a whole scientific and regulatory process that goes on behind it. So we're really hoping we capture that with this series. Um, so we ended up traveling throughout the U.S. and we got five different types of farms. Um, so we're really excited about that. And as with anything, it takes a village. Um, so as I mentioned, it was funded by USCC Grant and NOAA, and these were the many partners and collaborators we had who were advisors and um, some of the farms we were at um, who helped us put this video series together. This is not even a complete list of all the people who have helped and contributed to this series, um, but I want to thank everybody who took the time. It's really been a labor of love for a lot of us. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, this is not a complete list, but we are very grateful to everybody who helped contribute to this project. And this really goes to what we were talking about today. It can't be just one entity. It can't be just one person. It really has to be all of us collaborating and working together. Um, and this is our amazing film crew. Uh, so we have Andrew, our director of photography. And if you don't like the videos, you can find him. There he is. Uh, <laughs> Chris Corpus, Jack Lawson, I don't know if you're in this room or back, there he is, he's in the booth. Uh, Bailey, is Bailey here? Oh no, we missed Bailey. Uh, and DB, I know DB's here. Um, so this is our great film crew, um, and they worked really long and hard days. I was really impressed. I've never worked on a production of a series like this. Um, these guys are pulling off 16, 18 hour days, and they do it like champs, so thank you guys. You guys are amazing. Um, so, with that, um, we're going to go ahead and get you started. So, we, it's a series of five. Um, they're each about ten minutes long. The series itself is going to actually premiere online on October 12th. What we're going to show you today, we're going to show you a full uh, clip from our muscle segment in Maine. And then I'm going to bring our panelists up, who were um, farmers and a chef uh, who participated in the series. And we will go through different clips and we'll have a conversation about marine aquaculture in the U.S. So we're going to get kicked off here with our very first full-length video preview. So enjoy. As our population continues to grow, the ocean will be an important source of food. Seafood from responsible wild and farm sources can increase our supply of nutritious food 
while reducing our impact on land and freshwater resources. Marine aquaculture, or farming in the sea, is a promising opportunity to increase seafood supply while supporting healthy ocean ecosystems and communities. A movement is underway to complement our well-managed wild capture fisheries with responsible marine aquaculture to ensure that we have safe and nutritious seafood for generations to come. In this episode, I'm meeting with farmer Matt Moretti and scientist Holly Froelich at the shop at Island Creek Oysters in my hometown of Portland, Maine. Matt grows mussels, seaweed, and scallops here in Casco Bay. And Holly is an ecologist at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I mean, we're pushing the boundaries of, of land. You know, our population is increasing. Where are we going to get our food? I got an idea. You know, 71% of the planet, that's the ocean. A farm is the, it's the product of a community. Uh, and so I think it, it, it's right that we not force any one particular thing or method on a community, but rather allow them to evolve that you know, sort of regional economic, you know, sort of terroir, terroir sort Absolutely. of ethic yeah. on the, their own. The social dimension of aquaculture, just food in general, is it's really important. It's really critical. How people perceive things, it matters. That's part of the conversation of extracting out food from the sea. While the potential may be very, very high, there's other cultural significant things that can guide or determine how that looks. The White House, the Red Barn, the undulating hills, like we get it. We think the land is beautiful for our presence there. And yet, I think all too often we think the ocean beautiful for our absence there. You operate right on the coast in, in front of some million dollar houses. Do you have to deal with that? So we're close to the coast. So there's a lot of other users out there. There's recreational boaters, there's commercial fishermen, there's navigational channels. So we found a few spots in our local area that really worked well for us. They had the perfect conditions for growing our mussels and our kelp and our scallops, but they're out of the way of a lot of other people. There weren't a lot of lobsters around. There's no draggers going through that area and we're not in the way of navigation. So that really helped us um, be socially sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable. Um, if I could sort of compare it back to, to land farming. So we, our company right now, produces over 200,000 pounds of mussels each year. And our footprint in the ocean is 3.66 acres, which is an incredible amount of biomass That's for a very tiny Four amount. football fields, three football fields? Yeah, I don't know, something tiny. And actually, the infrastructure that we have at the surface is much less than that. If you are growing down. Because we're growing, yeah, gone. down, absolutely. Hey. So we're growing three dimensions in the ocean. Um, it's very space efficient. So if you did that amount of food on land, I don't know how many acres that would take, but I think it would be a lot more than 3.66. So do you think we should expand aquaculture? And what are what is it going to take to do that? If expansion of aquaculture, say in the United States, is something that we really want to pursue, means that we're all going to have to try to integrate across what's already in existence and think about what do we value? How do we create and streamline those regulations and permitting processes that allow this, some, this thing that we want to grow, but at the same time be very cognizant of what's already Absolutely, and another thing that I personally value, and I think a lot of people do, is, is the value of the coastal economy, which, um, you know, aquaculture can, can be a big part of in the future. In Maine, uh, there are fossil farms, there are oyster farms, there are seaweed farms all over the place, and they are starting to contribute in a large way to the coastal economy and the state economy and the regional economy. How do you see this sustainability at the farm level? Sustainability is, is incredibly important to what we do. I mean, it's our core mission as a company mm -hmm. to farm raise the finest seafood using only environmentally sustainable methods. And, you know, it's, it's our mission. Um, and uh, fortunately in Maine and in a lot of aquaculture that we're doing here, it's all of it is incredibly sustainable. Oyster farming, mussel farming, seaweed farming, all the farming we're doing is, um, is help, a lot of it is helping the environment at the same time. The American Dietary Guidelines recommend that we eat seafood twice a week as part of a healthy diet. Mussels are a great source of vitamin B12, selenium, and magnesium. Selecting the freshest mussels is key to a tasty meal the whole family can enjoy. Okay, so 
Now the tough questions for somebody like me, going to the grocery store, what do I look for in terms of picking out my muscles to take home and cook? Well, if that's the tough question, life is easy. So muscles are one of the easiest seafoods to buy. You go in, you want to see that the shells are intact. No broken shells. You want to see that they have a little sheen to them, that they're moist, that they've been kept moist. And importantly, you want to see that they're firmly closed like this. That indicates that the animal is still alive and still in a fresh state. All of the liquid, all of those wonderful juices and flavors are still in there. If you do see a muscle like this, because they do breathe air, if you just give it a tap, you will see that a live muscle will close. So you don't want to see a whole lot of those in the bag. But the other good thing about seafood really is that the best way to determine the quality is if everything around it looks fresh and clean, chances are that this is going to be too. Sure, good indicator. All right, so I said when I cook at home, but um, I gotta be honest with you, I don't cook. So for, for people like me, um, how, how do I do this? What do I do with mussels at home? Here's the other thing I love about mussels so much is that, um, do you have a pot? Yes. Okay, good, you can cook mussels. Do you have anything in your fridge? Yeah, probably wine. Okay. So. Good, you're literally halfway there. So uh, mussels can handle just about any flavor combination. They're what I call a pantry recipe. Okay. So you go to the store, you buy the mussels, that's it. That's all you need to worry about. You go home, you got white wine, you got mustard, you got some scallions, two leftover stalks of celery, literally whatever it is. If it seems like it would taste good to you, chop it up and put it in. You want to wash the mussels well uh, just to get off any residual grit or anything like that. Um, some mussels come with what's known as the beard or the byssus. That's by which they attach themselves to the rope. You just uh, thumb and forefinger, you pull that off, and then put it into the pot cold, add your liquid, whether it's water, wine, coconut milk, beer, whatever it is, your aromatics, whatever else you want in there. Mm -hmm. Cover the pot to a simmer. And as soon as the mussels open, handle that. they are cooked. And once the majority of the mussels are cooked, any that are still tightly closed, just discard those. Okay. These are a relatively affordable protein. You want to just make sure that you're eating the good ones. That's it. It's, it's not too bad. It's basically yeah. a choose your own adventure. I, can, <laughs> I think I can handle that. Cool. Yeah. Friends and family, join us to enjoy some of Matt's mussels and engage in conversation about marine aquaculture. Marine aquaculture is gonna play a vital role in diversifying and sustaining both the economic and cultural importance of our working waterfronts. I think aquaculture in the future will provide the nutritious and affordable proteins we need for our growing population, both in our country and globally. The ocean will play a critical role in the production of food to ensure that we can accommodate the growing population without compromising the health of the planet. The U.S. has the scientific knowledge and technology to grow marine aquaculture responsibly. Creating the right balance of food sources today will ensure there are healthy ecosystems and resources for many generations to come. Visit seafoodforthefuture.org for recipes and to learn more about marine aquaculture and the people who are innovating its future. So, sorry to interrupt for a moment. As our uh, panel gets seated, our 
crew wanted to do something special for Kim. Uh -oh. For those of you that don't know, this, uh, this is a surprise to her as well. Uh, this has been her baby for a long time, and we were all very proud of the opportunity to get to work with her and to see her kind of carry this vision through to make this production happen. And so whenever you're working on a, on a set, you've got your little slate to start clapper to make sure we're on time with sound and with video. And uh, what we wanted to do for Kim was we signed it and wanted to give it to her. It has her name on the front as the director of this production. Wanted to present that to Kim as a thank you for your work on this. Yeah, I want you to know I took many pictures of this and showed people that I was an official director. It was very exciting. Um, so thank you guys for making that dream come true for me. Who knew I would be director one day? Uh, so we have uh, Matt Moretti, we have Tyler Cordy, we have Julie Davis, Frank Roberts, and Chef Stuart Brioza. Um, so these guys have all participated in our series in various segments, so we're really excited to have them today. So I'm going to just let them go down the line, quickly introduce themselves and what they do. And we're going to start with Stuart, since Matt just had a starring role in the video. <laughs> Star. <laughs> Superstar. <laughs> we're going to embarrass you. It's going to be a good time. Oh, you want me to go first? Sorry. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no. no you, you go first. Sorry. That was all right. I'll I'll, I can introduce you. you. See, now it's just going to his head. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Moretti. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm Stuart Brioza. Uh, I'm a chef. Uh, I have two restaurants up in yep, San Francisco uh, called State Bird Provisions and The Progress. And uh, we work specifically with Hog Island, for sure. Uh, it's probably my biggest interaction here um, for oysters. Frank? Good evening. I'm Frank Roberts. I own and operate Ladies Island Oyster in Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh, we have a hatchery, we have a nursery, we provide seed for all the growers in South Carolina, and uh, we love what we do. Tyler Cordy, I'm the farm manager for Blue Ocean Mariculture. Uh, we do uh, yellowtail. <laughs> my nephew Declan is very excited about it. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were happy to have everybody out and come and see what we do. And uh, yeah, we're excited to be part of this program and help kind of bring the, the idea of aquaculture to the public and kind of change the, the idea of what we do out there. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name's Julie Davis. I'm Living Marine Resources Extension Specialist with the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium. That's a really long way of saying that I work with our commercial fishermen and shellfish farmers to make sure that they have the latest science and technology available to them so they can put it to work in their businesses. Right. So, yeah, Matt Moretti, <coughs> you saw uh, some really nice shots of our farm out there, I think. Those are fantastic. Uh, so you saw some mussels, but we also are doing farm raising kelp, and we just started farm raising sea scallops as well. Very new for us, uh, but very excited about it. Great. So um, what is it exactly that got you guys? So we'll start with you, Matt. Why did you get into marine aquaculture? What planted that bug with you? Uh, wow. Okay, so I grew up in Maine, and um, I think my, my father and I I've always been really enamored with the ocean. He grew up in Illinois, so he didn't have any ocean, but I think I've come to realize that the Mississippi River sort of had a big influence on him. <laughs> and then as soon as he could, he sort of moved uh, to the coast and he started lobstering. And so the ocean became sort of a big part of his life and then my life. I studied marine biology and at some point I realized aquaculture could actually be a career. So I jump, jumped in and uh, been doing it ever since. Julie? Yep. Um. So I'm born and raised in Nova Scotia, Canada, so just up the road uh, from you. 
And uh, for me, it was realizing that the uh, peer-reviewed publication in a journal, which nobody ever really reads um, is in science, it isn't the end game. The end game is somebody taking that science and applying it and, and really putting it to use um, in their business. And so that's what motivated me to get involved in aquaculture in order to improve production techniques, optimize production, so that people could be doing aquaculture in a way that was both environmentally and economically sustainable. Okay. Uh, well, I did grow up on the Mississippi River. <laughs> so it's gotten all over it and it inspired me to get away from it and go <laughs> towards the ocean. Um, so uh, I actually got into uh, education, so in conservation. So I went to school uh, for marine science and coastal ecology and uh, actually worked for almost a decade over on Catalina Island, just across the way here, uh, teaching about marine conservation. Uh, and one of the things we talked about was aquaculture. Uh, eventually, I wanted to not just have an influence on the next generation through education, but have an influence through actual production and kind of helping shape the face of uh, where fin fish production and aquaculture would go. Uh, so about 10 years ago, I got into that, and uh, I've been working in Hawaii and Panama and, uh, and different farms trying to get fin fish to do sustainable aquaculture and, uh, and influence the, how that's done in those management practices. So when, as the U.S. grows, it grows in the right direction. Great. Hank? Yeah, uh, my family settled at Chesapeake in 1696, both sides. <laughs> Uh, King's Grants, King Richard, King George, agriculture. And as I was growing up, I saw the Chesapeake die. But I grew up from my parents and my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents, you know, telling the, the, the life of the Chesapeake. And I watched it die. And I wound up in South Carolina where I saw a pristine environment. And I started oystering there. And I said, this is where I can make my last stand because the Chesapeake was gone. And I quickly sold all of my single oysters within a season and a half. I said, in order for this to be sustainable, I have to learn how to grow oysters. And always with the Chesapeake in mind, uh, we can't let that happen again. And so that drove me into mariculture. When I first saw my first eye larvae in 1995 under a microscope, I was just utterly fascinated. And uh, the journey began. And Stuart, how did you start working with Hog Island and, and other producers? What got you drawn to that world? Well, um, you know, I, I, I started working with Hog Island uh, probably, I'm going to say about 12 years ago when I was introduced to Hog Island, and that was just going to a party at, uh, at, at the island, at the oyster shop, and at that time it wasn't much of a oyster shop, it was just a picnic table and, and uh, a lot of great oysters. And, um, you know, I really quickly uh, believe that they were, th they were doing something that was just unbelievable and it really spoke to the Bay Area. And um, I worked for several years on trying to uh, formulate a relationship with Hog Island, and which took me to the oyster, to the the oyster farm, uh, on numerous occasions, talking to various farmers at the uh, at at Hog Island, and and slowly I just kind of climbed up the ladder, and uh, as our restaurant uh, gained a lot of notoriety in San Francisco, it seemed very clear, and I just kind of was like, you know, I'm I'm kind of done asking. We're State Bird. You're Hog Island. You know we should we should get together and you know make babies, um, and you know it worked. I don't know what I said, but it worked. Um, and so I think uh, um, that we've just had a we've had a great relationship ever since. And you know one of the few restaurants that that actually serve their their oysters. And um, I'm always very particular about when any of them come into dinner. You know. How are the oysters? Are we representing you well? You know, um, but we have just such an awesome relationship with them. All right. Okay. So this might get a little uncomfortable for you guys. So if you want to move to the front row, you can. So we're going to show a short clip, and then I'm going to have you guys respond to the clip. All right. So if you want to, you could sit in the front row when we show it. It's up to you guys. 
<laughs> or you can we, just we turn pick. around. Just don't go blind. Conservancy is. Can you guys you know, turn our that mission up? Is to protect the oceans, lands, and waters on which all life depends. Very interested, in particular, in California, in protecting bays and estuaries. And um, it turns out that eelgrass is one of the most critical species in bays and estuaries. And the people that are out in the bays and estuaries observing eelgrass most often happen to be these guys, the the farmers that are out there in their boats. Um, installing aquaculture gear and, and harvesting oysters out there. So what we're trying to do is generate some science to show how aquaculture and eelgrass interact. <laughs> I think in sustainability, oftentimes one of the things that doesn't really make it into the conversation is that we're sustaining communities. And, you know, the idea of sustaining the family farm that's been in the generation, you know, that plot of land is like, we, we get that. You know, but uh, maintaining the ability for a son or a daughter to stay here in, Maine, right. in the community. And you deal with this every day. So if they really kind of want to make a future in the water, it's not too mar far to think. Oh, I could I could farm this myself, and then I can control it. So, from our company's perspective, Ocean Approved, we, for a long time, were seaweed farmers. But we've realized very quickly that there's this incredible workforce out there um, of people who know how to grow seaweed. They always tell me they know how to grow it on their lobster traps by accident <laughs> every day. So they make good seaweed farmers, um, and they can go out and and start a seaweed farm, make it in the winter, which is opposite to their fishing season, and really kind of get a supplemental income to support their, their year-round lobster fishing. And what it really does is it sort of acts as a shock absorber mm -hmm. to the volatile price fluctuations in a wild fishery. You should see the innovation when you say to a lobster fisherman, oh, this is how you farm seaweed. It takes them about five minutes to learn it. And then they come back to me with about five innovations that they want to make to it and say, well, I just, I have this laying in my garage. Please, sorry guys. All right, so in those two clips, so we saw a very short blurb from the Hog Island episode. Um, so in that we had, along with um, Chef Stuart Brioza, um, we had farmers John uh, Finger and Terry Sawyer. And then we also had uh, Sarah Newkirk, who you saw here for the Nature Conservancy. And we had uh, Sarah Lummis from UC Santa Cruz. And so um, the Nature Conservancy and UC Santa Cruz are working with Hog Island to survey the eelgrass and look at how the eelgrass and the oyster farms are interacting with each other, both in a, either in a negative or a positive way. And it turns out that it might actually be a very positive thing. Um, so I want to turn the question to you guys. Um, if maybe some of you have examples, and I know Julie and Frank right here, of combining the science with what you're actually doing with the application on your farm um, and, and working with scientists for um, both efficiencies in uh, farming and economics, but also on the conservation side. So Julie and Frank, do you guys want to start with that? And um, Sure, I'll start with, uh, I'll let Frank cover some of the application to the hatchery of, of what we've done together. Um, but just as far as some of the science goes from our part of the world, uh, with specifically to do with oyster farming, is that we try and gather some of that science following on the, the eelgrass side of things and, and services. Um, there's a tremendous amount of ecosystem services provided by our farms. Um, in one example of that is nursery habitat for blue crab. Uh, a lot of wild oyster reefs in, in the South Atlantic and the Gulf don't provide a tremendous amount of habitat for juvenile blue crab or small, blue, you know, small blue crab. Um, and blue crab is a both is a very commercially important species. And and in amongst the oyster gear, we see. We see loads of them. Um, it's also used as an area where they will go to, to shed, to molt their shell. And then you see a lot of reproduction activity happening there. It's like a re little refuge for them because when they first shed their shell, they're soft, they're vulnerable. And so it's a, a nice little refuge for them at that, that point in their life. Um, and 
There's been studies done that show that the oyster farms provide, provide more habitat for blue crab than uh, seagrass beds, wild oyster reefs, uh, restored a traditionally restored oyster reef, so either bag shell or any other artificial type substrate. Um, and I think that, that speaks tremendously to how uh, shellfish aquaculture and the, and the gear um, used to raise the, the shellfish are, are restorative. And, uh, I can add to that, and I'll tell you a story about a friend of mine who started a, a uh, oyster farm in Rhode Island in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And he was in a saltwater pond, which is typically the environmental conditions of Rhode Island. And after he introduced a few million oysters into the saltwater pond, which was fairly turbid, it had no eel grass in it, uh, there wasn't much life in it or biodiversity in it. And that's the reason why the state allowed him to put the gear there, because there was no SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation, for his bottom gear to disturb. So after a few years of growing oysters, oysters filter, mature oyster, 50 gallons of water a day, they cleared up the water, and the eelgrass arrived, because the conditions were appropriate for eelgrass to flourish. So what does the state say? You have to remove your oyster gear, because you're interfering with the eelgrass. <laughs> it took them a while to, edu to educate the regulators that their eelgrass is here because of my gear. And they're like, aha. So those are the things that are occurring, as Julie said, uh, the habitat that the uh, oyster gear provides is incredible. Uh, the crabbers set their pots around our oyster gear twice as much as they set it any place else. Uh, recreational fishermen have realized that the place to catch fish is around our oyster gear because of all the juvenile thin fish and shrimp and crabs that take shelter within that gear. Uh, our gear is now a crab nursery. And I'll, I'll never buy a soft shell crab ever again because every time I go out and mess with the gear, I wind up with a soft shell crab to take home. And uh, I don't know the, the quantitative evidence of, of when a soft shell crab molts it's obviously a soft shell crab. It is vulnerable. Anything can eat it. And when they molt in the, in the confines of our gear, they're safe. And so they can, they can molt, they can mate, they can carry on with their life. It's substantial. I don't have the scientific data other than the crabbers set twice as much gear around our gear. And they don't do it for fun. They do it because it's productive. One other area of our industry, whether it's in shellfish or finfish or um, seaweed farming, um, that it only happens when we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> Bad juju. Um, where we rely a lot on science is on the hatchery side of things and seed production. Um, there's a lot of advances in that area where. Sometimes it's not necessarily research that needs to be done, but it's more about technology transfer. And so in South Carolina, that was our story. We didn't have a hatchery until a few years ago when, when Frank decided to establish his hatchery. And um, that meant bringing techniques and, and technologies that have been used in other parts of the country uh, to his hatchery so that seed could be provided for, for the growers in the state because we had been confronted with a restriction on importation of seed from outside of our state. And um, it turns out that's actually the, the way to make lemonade out of lemons in that situation was that it helps us to grow a more resilient industry because we're not reliant on the forces of nature or regulations or whatnot in another state um, because we're all, it's in-house, right? Um, the other thing that where a science and industry intersect with regard to hatchery would be in broodstock development. Um, so it turns out you need really good moms and dads to make really good, you know, babies. Um, or the, you know what be it fish or oysters or whatnot for instance in, in oysters for example we select for certain shell shape and and specific traits that we're looking for so there's different breeding techniques that 
that we use um, in order to, to look for those characteristics that are attractive to consumers and to meet, to meet that demand for those desired characteristics. Um, and maybe Matt can add something on the seaweed side of things. I know University of Connecticut has been very, it was a pretty active program in development of a lot of the technologies for kelp farming, I think. Um, but there's a constant intersection, at least from a sea grant perspective, I know that that's our focus. That's our agency's focus federally. Um, and there's 33 sea grant programs across the country that work to incorporate science into people's businesses. So there's a whole network of people just like me that, that that's our job um, and that are working hard to advance aquaculture in the U.S. Great, and, and I know Matt, you received a grant, right, to uh, play with a new technique for scallops. Yes, so we've been fortunate enough to receive a few grants, and when I say receive, we didn't really receive them, we haven't gotten the money, but we collaborated with some, a research organization that has a lot more scientific chops than us, uh, universities, uh, Sea Grant sometimes, uh, to, to work with them to do that, that work, and we sort of provide the on-farm uh, expertise. So we recently started working with uh, a nonprofit in, in our state of Maine called Coastal Enterprises Incorporated, and they secured a grant to bring the Japanese scallop farming technology to Maine to try it um, in Maine. And it's the first time that technology has been used in the United States. It's called ear hanging, where they actually uh, grow a scallop, a sea scallop up to a certain size, about 55 or 65 millimeters across, and then they drill a hole in the ear like the um, a point of the shell, and then they put the scallop on a pin, and they put that pin on a rope, and then you grow them hanging on ropes uh, in the ocean. It's uh, really interesting and cool to see, and we are about a year and a half into it right now, so the jury's still out, but it's a pretty exciting project uh, with a potentially very valuable product um, that's relatively new to the United States. Right. And, and one of the things that we also saw in the video clip with the seaweed was, and Matt, you touched upon this too, was the importance of the community element, um, community development, the economic side of it, and also um, fishermen. So in Maine, some of the lobster fishermen are farming seaweed in their off season. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so Maine has a very long uh, history of uh, working on the ocean, lobstering, all kinds of things. Um, so recently some fishermen have started to diversify their income uh, by doing aquaculture on the side and kelp farming actually works really well for that because you can lobster in the summer where the lobsters are inshore and that's the traditional fishery and then in the winter the lobsters move offshore and the winter is when you grow farm-raised kelp so lobster are able to do their normal making a living lobstering in the summer and then transition immediately to kelp farming in the winter um, so it, it's, uh, it's a new thing, but it seems to work really well, in, at least in uh, scheduling. And also, fishermen have all the knowledge necessary to work on the water that a lot of other people don't have. You know, it takes a certain sort of skill set and mentality to be able to go out on the ocean every day and, and make your living, and they absolutely have that. Um, so uh, other people have to sort of learn that, but they already have a, a leg up on the competition on that, in that, right? Great. Okay, so we're going to show a few more clips and then we're gonna put Tyler on the hot seat and also Stuart in a few minutes. So you guys can either stay there or you can go to the front row. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm giving you your workout. You have to earn your drinks. That's, that's how it works. In this episode, we're at Blue Ocean Mariculture in Hawaii, where we caught up with farmer Tyler Corti and NOAA scientist James Morris. This farm raises a tropical yellowtail fish called Kenpachi. It's the only offshore fish farm in the United States. Tyler and James are joined by Chef Colin Hazama to talk about farming fish in the ocean and why it can be good for ocean ecosystems and for people. The part of the culture uh, through many centuries was having fish ponds in Hawaii and, and making a sustainable source. A term in Hawaiian is called ahupua'a, which is from the mountain to sea of raising it to bring it to its certain source through where we can harvest it. And can you tell me a little bit more about that? 
you know, Hawaii has a, a rich culture in aquaculture. The Hawaiian fish ponds represent some of the oldest traditional aquaculture approaches, you know, in the world. And uh, you know, this, this place really abounds with the culture of aquaculture. We have to think about the whole ecosystem, similar to how the you know, Hawaiian fish ponds you know, utilize you know, from the mountain to the sea um, in terms of thinking about sustainability and sustainable approaches. We're very excited because we know that uh, we do have the science and technology today to, to do sustainable aquaculture. Here in Pona, Hawaii is a great example of sustainability in terms of being able to understand how the farm is functioning in the environment. But well, Tyler, how did you and the company decide to um, choose a location and raising the fish? In aquaculture, site selection is, is a big deal because you've got a number of things that come into it. And the first thing you want to think about is the environment and the fish. So we know we were looking for a deep water site. We know we were looking for a site that had uh, plenty of current and movement of water because uh, fish need oxygen. And the more turnover of the water we have, uh, the harder it is to work in, but the healthier it is for the fish. So we're picking a site based on that. Hawaii brought a lot of those things, uh, right temperature for growing this type of species, uh, good turnover, great water that's not, you know, we don't have a lot of upwelling here on the island because we're a rock in the middle of the Pacific. So we don't have a lot of competition with you know, algal blooms for oxygen. So the fish are in the same consistent environment year round. Mm -hmm. uh, and the depth of the site is also really important because fish eat and they do create waste. Um, so you want to make sure you can model how much biomass or how many fish we can actually raise in a certain area, uh, creating little to no impact around. And we monitor that every single month. So you use kampachi in your restaurant? Yes, I do. I actually prepare it in many different ways. I mean, most people try to eat it and prepare it, you know, sashimi or poke or, or raw or cured, but it's also really, really good to have it cooked, smoked, poached. I mean, it's so versatile. The fish, we picked it for a number of reasons, and uh, you know, it's one, a local fish uh, that can be used in so many different ways, and two, is a great fish for sustainability. Well, I'm glad you guys did because, man, it, that is phenomenal. It's, it's just got that nice marbling, uh, nice firm texture, and, and its freshness, and it's, it's so good for us as, as chefs to be able to produce and work with this kind of product because it's so consistent. Actually, a lot of customers or guests ask me, where is this wild fish caught from? And I have to explain to them that it's a sustainable source that is farm yeah. because it's so good. I think that's an important thing for the public to understand that be it land-based farming or aquaculture is that there's a whole community of researchers, scientists, extension agents like myself that work with our industries to make sure that, that they can apply the latest techniques in their business. And the fact of the matter is, is that if a farmer is not applying best management practices and not doing the best thing for the animal, and they're not going to be in business for very long. They're not going to have very good profit. And so by applying, uh, you know, the best techniques and by keeping that animal happy, then it's, you know, it's not only the best thing for their profit, it's the best thing for, for the planet as well. Mm. Oysters are graded like wine. People ask me, well, there's, that restaurant's carrying 10 different varieties of oysters. Yeah, that's what I want to see because our oysters are that good that we can stand up to those other nine branded oysters. In my grow-out area, from one end, from the north end to the south end, or the east end to the west end, are different flavor profiles, because there's different conditions within that area. Ah, uh, so, come on back up, guys. Um, so what you got to see there, um, so you got to see the only offshore fin fish farm that we have here in the U.S. and Hawaii. And then we saw a little bit from South Carolina. We saw a little bit of their hatchery. Um, Julie was talking about best management practices, and then we were talking about the marijuana um, and the different flavor profiles. So we're going to start with Tyler. Um, so fin fish in Hawaii. So one of the, the major things for sustainability, um, and is particularly with 
Finfish Farms is siting. And you had touched upon this in this segment. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you choose the site for your farm and, and why that's important? Yeah, so this site selection is kind of critically based on the species. It's, you know, whatever species you have, you have to figure out exactly what that species needs, what some of the challenges are, uh, and then address those challenges in your site selection. Uh, you know, one thing that we want to do to hit that sustainability mark is we want to have a fish that grows really well. Uh, and Hawaii is perfect for it because we have consistent temperatures. So having that nice same temperature, same growth season year round means we don't go into any wintering where the fish start to slow down. Uh, we avoid disease problems offshore because we have a good growing season out there. Uh, but you know, when you talk about diseases, uh, it's happened in, we talk about perceptions uh, a lot today. And uh, some of the perceptions in aquaculture come from poor site selection uh, where we put fish and it, it can't hold up for the amount of biomass that you need or the amount of fish that you want to grow there. So when we're hitting our sites out in Hawaii, what we're looking for is basically a really high current situation, uh, which just gets water flow going over and over the fish, which creates a large dispersion field. So the nutrients that are created by feeding and growing these fish can be dispersed into an environment that has the ability to take up those nutrients. Uh, and utilize them and keep the ecosystem in balance. So that's, you know, the main part of the site selection is one, the health of the fish, and then two, to make sure that it stays in balance with the ecosystem uh, that we're, we're working in. And one of the misperceptions about fin fish is the amount of wild fish to feed farmed fish. So can you talk a little bit about the feed that you're using and the methods that you use to feed to help reduce the amount of feed that's getting into the environment yeah so in, in fin fish culture feed is your your number one cost right the, the biggest thing I think 70% of our <laughs> of our cost of production comes from feed um, the feed that we use we actually you know we, we want to get the right profile for our fish so each fin fish that you grow a salmon is going to be different from a yellowtail or from a cobia or different types of fish they're going to need different proteins and different fats to grow um, and be healthy, have the maximum health and maximum growth rate. Uh, so all of our fish feed is sourced through a company uh, or multiple companies that look for sustainable um, fisheries in kind of anchovy or menhaden. Uh, and then we also look for fish trimmings. So we use um, you know, fish trimmings from the menhaden fishery. We use some um, uh, jack trimmings from South America. We go and we find areas where we can we can build up the right profile uh, of food source, the right proteins and right fat mixed together in a feed that has a minimal impact uh, on wild fisheries. Uh, but fish, uh, we're growing in carnivorous fish, and carnivorous fish eat other fish. Uh, so we do need to feed them fish feed that has <laughs> fish meal in it. Uh, the key is just sourcing it from other sustainable practices in uh, wild fisheries. So we're going to keep you in the height seat for a minute, but Julie had mentioned best management practices. And if you're operating responsibly, then your animals are going to be healthy and you're going to have a healthy environment, which you also need that healthy environment for healthy animals. So we're going to start with you on the finned fish side, and then I can ask Matt and Frank to jump in on some of the best management practices that you guys are using as well. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the great things out there is we talked about and we saw in the video there is just how clean and clear the water is. So that site selection was kind of the, the key for that management practice to jump out on is find the right site, make sure it can hold the biomass that we want to grow or the number of fish that we want to grow. Uh, the second thing is to make sure that the fish are always doing well and staying healthy. So when we're feeding fish offshore, uh, we've got a dive team in there or, or cameras and or cameras. Uh, every single feed event. Uh, so we want to make sure that the fish are maximizing, every fish is able to eat, uh, and that no food is being wasted. So we've got you know, guys monitoring the, the feeding on scuba that have communications up to the surface. We have cameras down there watching the fish as well uh, to make sure that, you know, one, our most valuable <laughs> input cost of production uh, isn't wasted, and then two, that every fish is engaged in that feeding and we're watching how those fish feed. A yellowtail jack feeds very different from, you know, a salmon or uh, from a cobia or from another type of fish. 
So the guys have to learn kind of their feeding behavior and the cues that they're giving to turn off. Um, so it's kind of one of those where science and art blend together, uh, where the team of farmers that we have out there know these fish. They know how they eat. They know when they're doing really well, when they're eating, uh, have a healthy feed ball going, and when they're about done. And they can see the cues of that and say, okay, turn off the feeding. These guys are about there, uh, which helps us get a really good growth rate without uh, in Kind of one of those big sustainability points is that you know, we can convert little amounts of food into a lot of fish compared to some of the other uh, animal protein industries like uh, poultry and cattle. You know, we're, we're sitting instead of feeding, you know, five pounds of uh, meal to get one pound of cattle or eight pounds of meal to get one pound of cattle, we're feeding about a uh, pound and a half per one pound. Uh, but you only get that when you're watching the fish and you're having those good management practices. Um, some of the other things that we do is uh, we use technology. Um, the pens that we use uh, are one of the big problems is when you're raising a bunch of animals in the same area is that you can get things like fouling, like, uh, you know, secondary algal growth, where in Maine, you know, they've turned it into an industry, which is really great. Uh, with fin fish, that can cause a problem because it's a competition for oxygen demand. Uh, so we use new technology like new types of netting um, to, to avoid fouling, uh, which right now we've been integrated a copper alloy mesh into our nets, which is basically a natural anti-fouling. So it allows us to maintain our cages with zero growth on them um, just by using the ability of uh, the, the state of the copper plus the ability of these pens to raise up and be dried. So we're using the sun to to uh, get rid of the biofouling versus using cleaning mechanisms and you know, causing a, a lot more work out on the farm. So there's different ways to, to utilize it. And uh, what we try to do is have the least amount of impact um, on the environment with the greatest impact in what we're able to provide to, uh, to our customers. And how often do your farmers go out and inspect the integrity of the structures? Uh, every day. <laughs> so, so we have a, a very, very tired group of farmers. <laughs> uh, there's about 16 of us, and I'd say each guy on average does about six dives a day. Um, so we're, we're, we're up at, we all meet in the morning at 6 a.m., and we're usually done about 6 p.m. So long working days, uh, hard farming days, uh, but we get to work in a beautiful environment. But in, in order to make sure those fish are doing good, you know, we're watching them feed. Uh, we go and we check the structures of every cage every single day. Uh, and then we go in and we actually take fish samples uh, once a week uh, to do necropsies on the fish to uh, you know, do make sure that you know, they're growing well, they're healthy, nobody's getting sick in the cages. Uh, and that's allowed us to not use anything like antibiotics or any chemicals on the fish for over 10 years. <coughs> Um, so, Matt, what are some best management practices that you guys are, are using on your farms, on your three species? Yeah, we, farming shellfish is a lot different than farming fish in terms of its complexity. Um, they, we don't have to feed them, so uh, a lot of that work is, is already done for us. They just feed off the nutrients around them. So it makes it a lot easier, uh, a lot more simple process. We don't do uh, six dives a day. We don't do any dives a day, fortunately. <laughs> it's pretty cold in Maine waters. <laughs> Um, but uh, so we're we're still pretty relatively small operation. So our a lot of our best management uh, practices aren't officially written down, but they're more understood. And uh, the exception to that is uh, in our you know, food safety protocols. You know the amount of time uh, that the mussels can be out, the shellfish can be out of water before they're refrigerated, the temperature that they have to be under. All that stuff is very official and regulated and uh, and um, official. Uh, but other things we're sort of still learning a bit as we go, like the density of our muscles on the line, like how many lines, uh, how many muscles per foot, number of lines of muscles under each uh, raft. It's all sort of, uh, we're still learning, um, but we're, we're doing pretty all right on that so far. But it's, it's not quite as critical to be exact in farming shellfish as it is to be in fish, uh, farming fish. And Frank, do you have anything to add to that in terms of your best of, practices? A lot of similarities to what, to what they're doing in Hawaii. Uh, one of our first BMPs is site selection. Uh, oysters grow in specific environments very well, other environments not so well. So we select a site for our gear. Uh, we used to use ground gear. We've learned that it's not optimal conditions. What is optimal conditions is floating gear. 
and one of the reasons floating gear is optimal is oysters feed on phytoplanktons. And phytoplanktons occur in greatest densities at the sea surface. That's where the sunlight penetrates. So that's where your greatest density of phytoplanktons are. So by placing the oysters in the top surface waters, they're getting optimal feed. The next thing we, we look at is, is the site selection. Uh, you want an area that's got water moving, because again, we don't feed ours, we have to present food to them by way of current, whether it be tidal currents or wind-driven currents. And these currents got to be such that are optimum for the oysters to open and feed. If the currents are too aggressive, then the oysters can't feed because the gills cavitate. And if they, if it's just like a prop in a, in a boat cavitating, you're not going anywhere. It's just spinning air and water. Oysters can experience the same thing. Also, if they're in too high a wave energy area, the equipment can handle it, but the oysters literally get beaten to the point where they can't open and feed because they're too busy getting jostled around. And it actually is trimming the shell. The new growth is being trimmed off. So uh, site selection uh, regarding those things is really important. And you're going through a permitting process too. So you better have your site selection proper. Because if you're going to spend two years in a site selection, you better make sure the oysters are going to grow there. <laughs> because you just went a stack of paperwork that thick through all the bureaucratic agencies, Army Corps, OCRM, DNR, the National Marine Fisheries, Coast Guard, CEI, uh, CIA, DEI, FBI, um, you name it. <laughs> the they're, they're, they're on you. So you, you better do your homework. And uh, uh, the other uh, really important thing is density. Uh, you want to make sure that you have the proper amount of oysters within those bags where they can grow optimally. Uh, one oyster per bag will grow very well, but that's, there's not a profit model there. So we're still in business, so we, after years and years of data collection and harping on density, uh, we've been able to find the, the proper formula for our particular area. Uh, it, it varies depending on where you are, and my site is vast, and there's different locations that have different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, Biofouling is, is a number one uh, operations for us and we're, we're dialing that in just like uh, biofouling can clog the nets uh, impeding flow uh, for us flow is food the, the the food is in the flow and so if our gear is fouled and the flow can't occur the oysters can't eat they can't eat they can't grow so so we're constantly managing our our uh, our oyster farm because it changes as the seasons the following changes, the winds change, the currents change, the water temperatures change. All these are triggers in our environment that are cause, have cause and effect. And I think we've gotten pretty darn good at recognizing these and that we're able to grow a really good oyster with a lot less effort now because we're, we've learned to, to, to work with the uh, environmental conditions in our area. Great. So, Frank, we're going to stick with you since you were talking about the miroir of your oysters and you were talking about how you have different flavor profiles throughout your growing area. So, can you talk a little bit about that and then we're going to let Stuart talk a little bit from the chef's perspective about the different tastes of oysters? Yeah, oysters are grated like wine. Uh, a clam is a clam is a clam. We grow a really good clam in our area. I'd, I've grown, I've harvested clams up in the, up in the uh, Great South Bay when I was a kid, and that's a, a really good clam. Our clams are just as good. I actually think even a little bit better. But it doesn't matter in the market, because a clam is a clam is a clam. It's a commodity, it's 23 cents no matter where you go, or 30 cents no matter where you go. Oysters are graded like wine. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was at the, the PGA holds their golf tournament at Hilton Head every year. And I was in the boardroom with the PGA and the Sea Pines board of directors was there too. And they were talking about serving oysters for, for the, uh, the golf event. And I passed out the oysters. They ate them. They loved them. And the, uh, the, the food purchaser for the Sea Pines was like, these are really great, but we're not paying you the 75 cents you normally get from wholesale, and we can buy a golf oyster 
for 23 cents. And a head chef for the entire Sea Pines, who, who's the head chef for 12 restaurants, stood up, slammed his fist on this 15 foot by 40 foot long mahogany table, surrounded by all these board members, and they suck! <laughs> They're flat, they're flabby, they've got no flavor. And, and he said they'll pay the extra money for them. And what he was talking about was the maror, the flavor profile. Uh, our oysters are often compared to the Normandy France oyster. Uh, that's the flavor profile they have, a nice briny start, a, a clean, almost uh, lettuce-like middle, and a subtle finish that just begs you to eat another one. Because you're, you're eating this amazing uh, oyster, and it just slowly disappears. And I was like, where'd it go? You know, I want another one. And, and that's the flavor profile of our oysters. Uh, one end of our 16 square mile area is up against the ocean. The other one is further inland, or, or further upstream. It is subject to a little bit more fresh water, has a little more vegetation, uh, Spartina grass, et cetera. So you get these little subtle, subtle nuances in the flavor profile. And well, people ask, well, you're in a raw bar that's got a dozen different uh, American Eastern oysters in it. Sure, they're all the American Easter oyster, but each one has its own flavor profile. I had some last night in a restaurant here that were from just north of here. You know, it had a flavor profile that was really good and it was nothing like ours, which is really awesome because that's now the trend now is to order a dozen oysters, three of which from a different region, and, and do the flavor profile and pair it with a great wine and, and actually have a conversation about it. So it's it's turned into a, a really fun food to enjoy. So, <laughs> yeah. Let's so, get some. so chef, do you do you find that in your restaurant? Are people ordering different oysters from different areas and taking a taste tour of oysters? Yeah. Well, you know, um, no, because we 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 just have one oyster that oh. we serve, and it's the Sweetwaters. Um, but you know, there are times throughout the year that. Uh, for, for various reasons, uh, uh, specifically revolving around when we do get rain, um, that, you know, there's a, they cut off the oysters or there's a, a, a small gap or something, and, and we'll source other oysters. And I do eat other oysters, of course. Um, but I, I do I totally agree with this, the, the meroir. I mean, it's like when you're traveling and you drink just the local water. Right, right. You're just drinking tap water, and it tastes different than the water you have at home. That you're very. And that's your. That's your. Your definition of of good water, or at least water that you're you're consistently drinking. Um, and and oysters have that absolute. And it is, you know, it's specific to the type of oyster, the seed that it's coming from. Um, however, it is it is the phytoplankton. It's the how much movement it's getting. Um, I think water temperature plays a huge role in oyster, uh, you know, uh, taste, but I don't think that there's science behind it because if you take the same lateral line and you look at what's happening, the oysters that come out of Washington and laterally across the country, and I guess that would be upstate New York, right? Some, somewhere around there. Um, Maine, Maine, Maine ish. Maine, you know, Maine. you have lettuce, oyster, lettuce -y melon finish on the West Coast, and you have, you know, and, and these are very generalized profiles, uh, but you'll have kind of a larger, saltier, brinier oyster, you know, coming from up north. And then even sweeter, I think, sweeter and flatter as they go up into Nova Scotia, right? The Beausoleils and St. Simone's and things of that sort. Um, but I, I, we, we, we think about oysters and what we're going to put on those oysters based on their flavor profile. Um, not all oysters, I think, benefit from a squeeze of lemon. You know, not all oysters benefit from a mignonette. Um, I do something totally radical where I, I actually use seaweed that's grown just up the coast. Um, in Mendocino and, and do kind of a seaweed mignonette, uh, pickled seaweed that sits on the oyster, um, as well as a, a fermented kohlrabi on oysters. Um, but that's taken a while to kind of dial those flavors together to make them harmon like harmonize. 
Great. So <laughs> I'm actually going to then start with you this time. So I want to give you guys a, a final chance. What is it that you want this audience to know about marine aquaculture in the U.S.? We're going to start with Stuart, and we're going to, yep. We tell them, eat our oysters naked. <laughs> <laughs> It depends. <laughs> I would I would just add to the to the marijuana discussion to um, it, in order to enhance that discussion over your different varieties of oysters that Frank was talking about. There is a tasting wheel that was developed by a world champion shucker named Patrick McMurray. He wrote a book <laughs> called Consider Consider the Oyster Field uh, Shuckers Field Guide, and it's a wheel. It's a little diagram. And it will, it will allow you to describe what you're already tasting. And if you want to be like an official oyster snob, like that's, that's what to become familiar with. So, you know, just to get the conversation going if you're wanting to go in that direction. All right, Stuart, so what, what is it that you want this audience to come away with about U.S. marine aquaculture? Hmm. Well, um, that it's here and now. Uh, I think that the Meroir is an incredible asset to uh, oyster farming um, because it does. It's a sense of it's a sense of place, and you really create that. Um, you know, if you think about all other flavors, whether it's wine or beer making, or um, you know, they're all integrated. Or the farming that goes on around um, the oysters. You know, that that oyster culture. Um, it, it is all integrated, and it is something that I do travel for. When I go to South Carolina, I, I was telling Frank that that is, I look forward to eating like Carolina oysters. Um, it, they're so different, and they're just sort of like I feel like I'm I'm somewhere different uh, as well. Um, and I think part of that is is like the environment in which you're eating them in, as well, right? Mm -hmm warm summer night in Charleston, it's a little muggy. We don't have muggy, you know, so it's usually cold with a blanket eating oysters uh, yeah, and tamales to bay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please do. Um, but you know, they, eating particular oysters in their environment is such a privilege and such a treat that um, I, I think that that's probably one of the, the biggest take homes for me on marine aquaculture is, is embracing kind of it really a tradition of, of, of um, oystering. Um, for fin fish, I think it's an absolute, it's so important to back people who care about the environment. And I think that this is such an important choice. I, I make it a point at both of our restaurants that we do serve aquaculture fin fish. Um, for the sole purpose that we have to eat it to grow it and to save it and to kind of really get better at what we do. Um, the more that we embrace as people eating aquaculture of any, site, uh, any type, the, the more that we're gonna come to accept it and incorporate it into our daily life without such challenges. And, you know, this kind of, these triumphs that we have to try to, uh, the big stones that we have to overturn. Anyway. Great. Right. Thank you. I look forward to eating some farm fish at your restaurant. Okay. <laughs> Break. Uh, it's, it's where we have to go. Uh, we need to do it to, to, to feed us. Uh, like the chef was saying, you, you eat, if you were to eat our, one of our oysters here, it's going to take you to Buford. You may ne never have been there, but it's going to take you there. Uh, we had in entered an oyster contest in Chicago years ago, and we swept it. And one of the chef's judges says, where does come oyster come from? And they actually had to big dig the box up and said, Buford. And the chef said, what's a Buford? <laughs> he, and, the, and the guy says, I don't know. And the chef said, I don't know either, but I want to go there because I just tasted the place and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So with, and watching the chef in that segment eating your fish, that chef traveled there when he ate that fish. He traveled to that place. 
So we, we need to form that relationship with our oceans. So even if you're landlocked or you're on the west coast, you can visit the east coast. And I can visit the west coast by eating yours oysters or, or Hawaii by eating that fish and appreciate it. So that we, in, in Beaufort County is 65% salt water. We're a collection of about 60 or 70 small islands within, that's why it's called the low country, because it's low. And uh, the, the salt water in our marshes define our community, and we're very protective of it because it, it's the fabric of our community. And so eating mariculture, oysters, clams, mussels, will take you there, and it'll, you'll just naturally become a steward of that coastal environment, even if you're living inland. And I have to say, you saw some clips from it. I would love to go to South Carolina again at, with the Spanish moss and the cicadas in the background. So it's a great place to be if you want South Carolina oysters. Great vision. And I think Frank is bucking for a ticket to Hawaii, by the way, with his comments. Come with a bag next, of oysters. Next you trip. How'd I do? <laughs> You're great. So, so Tyler, what, what would you want the audience to know about marine aquaculture? Well, I think mostly that mariculture is not something new. Mariculture has been around for centuries, and it's also, uh, globally, it's taken hold in a, a lot of different countries. We're, we're a little bit late to the show, um, which has a disadvantage and has an advantage. Uh, the advantage is we can set the tone right now. And you know, with the people who have been here and the people who are driving the industry right now, a lot of that tone is being set with conservation in mind. Um, so we have a really good uh, advantage in that we can learn from mistakes in the past uh, that have been you know, hard lessons learned elsewhere. Uh, we own and drive the technology uh, for the future. And we have that ability. And all it needs is the final support. Um, you know, from, from basically our culture changing its mind and seeing uh, the benefits of aquaculture and the benefits of mariculture. Um, so the, the main thing that, you know, I, I want everybody to take away from this is that mariculture is here, uh, one, because we need it, and two, it's here to drive uh, the, the safety and the ecology and conservation of our oceans. Julie? Try not to make it screech again. Um, the number one thing I want you all to know um, from tonight is to eat aquacultured seafood and feel good about doing it. Um, there's a whole bunch of people around this country that are really smart, really hardworking. I'm sitting right next to a couple of them. Um, there's hundreds more that aren't here because they're out there working their butts off and growing some really great seafood. Um, this is aquaculture represents a job opportunity that should be a preferred alternative for job development in our coastal communities in the US. Um, it can create opportunities that are, um, for education, um, research, entrepreneurship, all these great things. It can also keep some of our traditional working waterfronts, which a lot of us have seen dwindle. It can help revitalize those or stabilize um, those working waterfronts. And um, and it's really good food. It, it tastes great, like we've heard about. Um, and the other thing, I know you said one thing, but I have another thing. Um, <laughs> find your local farmer just go find them you know in the days of, in nowadays of the internet and Google and all these things just Google it and find your local farmer and call them up or email them or something and find out if you can go for a tour meet them see the farm um, and then be proud equally proud of of what they're doing because um, you'll probably meet somebody who's smart, passionate, and producing some really great food. Yeah, you said it. <laughs> so I guess my final take home message is uh, it's, it's an opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity. It's been fantastic for all of us, I think. And uh, it can be great for you guys. Uh, we should do more of it and support it when you can. It can be environmentally sustainable, delicious, and uh, great for the economy. So 
the more the merrier. Great. So uh, you, you did get a little taste of the series. You got to see a full um, clip. Remember, there's five of them. These guys are featured in it. Um, so that will be available on October 12th at seafoodforthefuture.org. You can watch all of them in their full entirety. We have um, online now, if you go to seafoodforthefuture.org, you choose Ocean to Table. We have some recipes featured on the website. We have um, some information about these guys, some photos, some behind the scenes. Um, and we have a couple uh, teasers on there, so you're welcome to check that out in the meantime. But October 12th, full series launches. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today. I want to thank USC for funding this project. I want to thank our great panel, and thank you so much for taking the time to come out here. Um, thank you. And thank you to our crew, by the way. You guys are amazing. You did a great job. And that's a wrap. <laughs> Uh, and just a reminder, if you're coming to the meeting tomorrow, it is in our admin offices at Catalina Landing, not here. All right, thank you. Have a good night.